excited to introduce you to Jason Hewlett. Uh, Jason, thank you for coming on. Thanks uh, for having me. Yeah, no problem. I, I met Jason many years ago um, as uh, through uh, an organization called National Speakers Association. I actually got to uh, see him up on stage first and then introduce, introduce myself to him. He was kind enough to say hello as he was saying to everybody else, which is pretty cool with speakers. Sometimes they get up on stage and, you know, you get off and, you know, they're gone. And uh, Jason was one of those guys that impressed me by sticking around and, and talking to everybody and taking pictures. And I actually have a picture of him uh, doing one of your, uh, your, your, your famous facial expressions of the, yeah, there it is. <laughs> yep, that's it. Um, that's the iconic uh, Jason Hewlett face. But, um, uh, and then I followed you, followed your career um, for the last, you know, probably seven or eight years or so. And most recently, uh, I purchased your book called The Promise. I, uh, I listened to it. I read it. I listened to it again. I uh, had quite a few giggles. I left. I listened to it at night. I think my wife was wondering why I was laughing in my sleep. Uh, most recently, I was on a walk and uh, a couple of the stories you were telling me, you know, the uh, picking up the dog poop in the snow. That was hilarious. Uh, your, 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 uh, my dad was a high school uh, basketball coach. That was my, my sport that I love to, you know, I'm passionate about. And uh, so I really connected with the, the basketball stories and the influences your coaches had on you. Um, but uh, one of the things that I, that I said in the last podcast I was able to do, and I had heard actually at a National Speakers Association was one of the keynote speakers said the best interviewers are people that ask questions and get out of the way. Um, so um, I'm going to do my best to do that, which I'm not too good at by the way. So, um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm, I'd like to really just set it up and just, you know, a little bit about your, about yourself, which I think most people should definitely when in reading and hearing the book, uh, they'll learn that, but really get into the promise and how, um, how, well, just about the promise and, and how you, how you feel it can really help people become the best versions of themselves, especially if you're a leader, uh, cause if you're a mess, who's going to follow you. Right. So, um, so yeah, a little bit about about your journey to this point and what brought you to this book would be um, super informative. Awesome. Well, thank you, Coach Hughes. Yeah. What a nice intro, man. And I really appreciate that you read the book. I'll be candid. So many podcast interviews I've done where they're just like, they don't even know I wrote a book and were interviewing me about the book. And so thank you for reading it, listening to it, laughing with it, connecting to it. And thank you to the listeners and viewers of this podcast, because when we talk about leadership and we talk about promises, people might wonder, well, what does that have to do with me? You know, what is my promise? If you've never thought of that question for yourself, that's what I like to talk about, yeah. especially in terms of being a leader. You know, what kind of a leader do you want to be? Do you want to be the kind that, you know, domineers and rules, or do you want to be a servant leader, somebody who does extraordinary things that people don't even know about? That's what the promise really is. So my background is, I, I mean, I grew up in a place called Park City, Utah, which is a ski town. Yeah. And I, I grew up skiing, I grew up playing basketball and uh, had a very successful family. My, my dad was successful in the financial services. And, uh, and eventually I found my way to being a Las Vegas performer and as a musical artist. So John, if you can imagine me as a Ricky Martin impersonator or Elton John impersonator, I started with the Las Vegas Legends in concert and uh, performed all over the place. They, they even had shows in Atlantic City over there by you. Yeah. And, uh, and so as a performer, ran around impersonating other people and really finding out early on in my life that every single person has what I call a signature move whether that's a signature song or a signature look, something that makes them unique and stand out in a sit down world, that's your signature move. And as an impersonator, all I had to do was highlight the signature move of the artist I was impersonating. So if I was doing a Ricky Martin impression for those that are watching this, all I had to do is put my arms out and swivel my hips and have a nice smile and be like, Live la vida loca. and that looked enough like him and then I'll, with the Elton John, I just put the glasses on and, and I would play the piano and I'd sing, uh, you know, and I think it's going to be a long, long time to touch down, bring me round again to find I'm not the man that think I am at home. Oh, no, 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 I'm a rocket man. So I would just figure out kind of their tonality 
their signature voice and their signature songs. And I would just impersonate those and become like them. So for those that are listening or watching, consider for yourself, what is your signature move? And it's your promise to share that with the world because that's what makes you unique. And so as a speaker now, having gone from entertainer guy to now speaker guy on leadership, I teach through the power of impersonations and music and comedy, how every leader has a promise to keep by sharing those signature moves. Yeah, and I think your story resonated with where when you were younger, um, you know, maybe as a student, uh, you know, you were trying to figure out your, your stride there. Maybe you weren't as good as a student as you would like to. I was definitely that person. Uh, ADD, struggled through academia, um, lost, and then I ended up finding – I've always knew I wanted to be a coach. I always knew I wanted to be a teacher, um, being my father was one. And uh, I, I found that that was my, that was my gift. And I, I didn't know if that was going to be the gift I was going to be able to continue with, but I was lucky enough to have that opportunity. And my promise is to continue to do that. And I, and I love your story. And, and definitely if you read the book, which everybody needs to pick it up, you'll, you'll get to hear more of your journey through, through high school and, and through discovering your talents as a singer. Uh, I love the dentist story. You know, talking about your dentist was one of your, your biggest mentors. Uh, you have quite a few mentors. And how important are mentors, you think? Uh, you know, maybe you didn't realize that they were mentors at the time. But in reflecting back, you know, and through your story and hearing from the dentist to your, uh, you know, to the, the high school coach, to the, the college coach that invited you to be uh, a scholarship uh, were, were you a scholarship athlete or were you the entertainer for the team? Which, 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 which was it? It's great, a funny story. story. Oh, it's, it's a awesome. funny story. His name was Coach Tony Ingle, and sadly, we lost him to COVID in January of 2021. My hero, truly, my best friend. And he offered me a scholarship to a school called Brigham Young University, which is no shabby offer to get to something like that, Division I. But he offered me a full-ride scholarship to be the manager of the basketball team because he said, I want you on the bus. You're so funny. And you can totally practice with the team. You're good enough to play, but not good enough for a full ride as a player, rather as a manager. Funny enough, John, I, I ended up not doing that scholarship. Instead, I went and served a mission trip for two years in Brazil instead. And yeah. so my life kind of took a different turn. But I'll tell you, your question about mentors, you don't realize someone is mentoring you, usually until after the fact. And then you go, whoa, that person changed my life. Mm -hmm. And then we honor them more as the mentor that they are. What's interesting about this cycle of mentorship is we receive mentors throughout our lives, hopefully, if we're in the right place, right time and right frame of mind. And then equally, we become a mentor. And when we become a mentor to others, then we really notice what the mentors did for us in our lives. So when people start asking us to teach them, coach them, help them, whether you're a manager or a leader in your position at work. Think about the mentors that taught you what made you great, mm -hmm. helped you with your skill set, and how you can now take your signature moves that make you unique, your gifts, your skills, your talents, and mentor somebody else. That's where keeping the promise is so beautiful in the terms of being a mentor. And that's why I love your name as the coach coach hughes there's no greater honor than being called the coach yeah no and i, and I don't uh i don't i take that very seriously knowing that a lot of people call themselves coaches but really what is a coach um and there's not that many of them out there a lot of people have the title kind of a lot of kind of like a lot of people have the title of leader but it's what they do it's not the title um and uh yeah, I mean, again, again, those stories of those different people influenced your life. Your father, obviously, um, you know, the gentleman who, uh, who who said you should go to Vegas. You know, each one of these people who came into your life uh, helped you uh, along the way. And I think that's one of the things a lot of people don't pay attention to. Well, one, I don't think they really know to pay attention to, to every person they come in contact with, there's an opportunity to grow and learn from. Um, it's something else you spoke about in your book and the promise was about, you know, continually learning to better yourself. Um, 
And I love how you spoke about how, you know, here you are, you're teaching others. I always felt there's a hypocrisy to what I do sometimes where I'm teaching people uh, how to be a leader, how to, how to set goals, how to accomplish it. And then I'm, but I'm not, I'm still figuring that out. And I love how you share stories throughout the book about how here you are leading and on the stage in front of thousands of people. I mean, if you watch your intro video, it's amazing that opening where you're standing in front of a stadium of people and they're all applauding and they're all calling your name, you know, but quietly you have these, these, I don't want to say doubts. I don't know. Maybe that's not the right word. What would you call that? Um, but never giving up the promise to continue to, to never give up and, and always be better. Uh, that's one of the messages that I got out of your book for sure. Well, thanks, John. And you know, with a crowd like that in front of 10,000 people or more at a stadium, it's interesting the balance we have to have as leaders or as performers, because we're all performers, we're based upon performance in our work, no matter what industry we're in. But think about what I'm going through before I go out on that stage. Mm -hmm. I have to have a certain level of confidence that is almost uncanny. It's ridiculous that I'm going to go out there and make silly faces and do these things with my nose and my face and my voice and sing high and low and be silly and try to make them laugh or inspire them. I have to be confident enough to go out there and feel like I know what I'm doing. I've practiced enough. I've kept enough promises to myself, which compounded upon the consistency of daily work to get to that point. And yet, I have to also be humble enough mm -hmm. to ask for some kind of extra strength, if you will, from a deeper source. And so whether it's a prayer or meditation or wherever you need to find it, to not only be humble enough to improve upon the performance after it's been delivered and received a standing ovation, but equally to have the amount of confidence needed to go out there and kill it, to mm -hmm. be the kind of performer that people expect you to be as a leader. It's not a matter of cockiness, I don't believe. I don't think it's ego. I think it can lean into that eventually if you get too big headed, sure. but then you lose your opportunity for being humble. And humility is truly one of the great traits I feel that every leader can have in learning consistently from others, from mentors, from those that are younger than them, from their own experience, from watching their own performance on film or listening to a sales call or a team meeting, those types of things can transform the way that we lead and keep our promise. And so, yeah, standing up in front of a big crowd, a wild experience. And I never take it for granted, especially now, because it's been over a year since I've had something like that. Now it's all virtual. So now it's like I'm performing to uh, the wall. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. so many people are just giving people what they want to hear today. And it's really jaded so many people. A lot of I, I teach a lot of young managers and, and leaders that either are coming into the business or are in it for a while. And the companies that they're working for will throw out a promise of a manifesto or a mission statement. And then, and then the person is lured to that, but then their focus is on the profits and they get jaded and they, they, they become distrustful and um, you know, the, the, the genuineness that we need in leadership today uh, is missing, you know? It's quite essential, you know, and unfortunately a lot of people get too big headed about themselves or they feel that they can create something that's not real or authentic and genuine is a powerful place to be. And, and if we're getting to the place where we maybe are too scripted, maybe mm -hmm. we're just going through the motions each day with each interaction, but the customers can tell. The team members can tell when we are going through those motions rather than just trying to empathize with the situation or ex give them an experience that I call an engagement experience. It, that's why I like to talk about the promise because mission statements are dead. Mm. They truly are. They're dead because what person can actually just plow out and, and recite their mission statement of their company. Very few can, unless they have to say that every single day in a team meeting. Right. Rather, what if they had a promise that they just initially lived by personally, their personal promise proclamation, 
to say to themselves every day, I put on that outfit before I go into my work. My proclamation to myself, my promise is that I will spread joy to every person I come in contact with. Let's say that's your simplest level of promise. Well, that's also profound because you're going to, in every single moment, have an opportunity to influence somebody, to give them something a little bit more of an experience that they weren't expecting. And that's when we over deliver on the promise that they even assumed upon entering your building, whatever the brand may be. They're expecting a certain promise just from the brand because of the commercial or their past experiences. Are we over delivering on that promise or is the commercial greater than the reality? We always want the reality to outweigh the commercial when it comes to our interaction with those that we serve. Yeah. And I think two, two big bucket um, items for me was the um, you had talked in one of your chapters about habits the promise of, of habits. And then the second part, if you can talk to that and then talk to the, talk to, um, the, the, you know, the part of the promise of taking care of yourself. And um, we chatted earlier and I, uh, the line I kind of finally was able to put out articulately to m- the people I work with is when you are working on yourself, I think people perceive that as being selfish. And what we need to teach people is, when you're being selfish is when you're not working on yourself. Um, You talk about how when you're away, you walk, go on walks or how, uh, you know, you're chewing your fingernails or, you know, uh, how, how your, your uh, energy drink story was great. I I love that one too. I think a lot of us can relate to that, especially when you're working a lot, but if you could talk to the promise of keeping a habit and then maybe the promise of not being, of, of taking care of yourself and not feeling selfish about it. Because I think a lot of people feel like uh, if I take care of myself, I'm, that's not, I need to be taking care of others. And you can't take care of others when you don't take care of yourself. Well said. Yeah, let's talk about habits. I mean, this is an awkward one for me to talk about anyway, <laughs> because as I wrote in the book, I said, I am not an expert at this at all. I have my bad habits, whether it's an energy drink, one too many per day or chewing the fingernails, whatever it might be. And so when we consider our own habits, what are they? Whether it's waking up and the first thing that you touch is your phone and you're plowing into social media and looking at the news and all the bad stuff or sad stuff that's happening in the world. And then maybe your next habit would be that you eat a donut for breakfast instead of something healthy. Uh, Whether it's you're racing to work in your car and you're listening to something you don't need to that makes you down instead of something that inspires you. It's really just a self-assessment is really the point of the habits portion of the book. It's not to make anyone feel bad. In in other words, I'm like confessing all of these terrible habits I have. And people are going, why did you write that? You have those habits and share that. And I said, because I want the person reading this book to realize I am not preaching to you. I am sharing with you the struggle that is creating a great habit. And so how do we, how do we end a bad habit or create a good one? I mean, we try to touch on that a little bit. It's Mm -hmm. not like atomic habits by James clear. It's not that great of a, you know, a a habits chapter as a book, but tell me what you were thinking, John, before I keep going. Well, no, I think, I think part of it is just that. I think that when you read a, you know, whether it's Stephen Covey or Tom Cavett, you read the book about habits, you know, um, but habits are choices. Habits are, you know, sometimes they're, you know, things that are unrealistic, but I, what I liked about your, your approach to it was real. And the fact that the little things that you brought up as your bad habits were things that you would think weren't a big deal, but that wasn't the, that wasn't the point, you know, again, the fingernail part, I don't want to ruin it for everybody because you got to buy the book. You got to listen to it too. But it's just the idea of like, you know, that's a habit that you are aware of, but you know, it's, it's a microcosm of, uh, of bigger things, right? Exactly. Well said. I mean, uh, for years, I've been trying to stop the habit. I mean, I'm still struggling through it even after writing the book. And I was thinking to myself, coach, I was like, once this book comes out, I have to be done with the bad habits. And then I thought, I'm, I'm not perfect. I'm not trying to be, you know? And so the point of the book is also within the habits, not only to acknowledge that we have them and work on them, whether it's 
we have 10 fingers and we need to stop biting one of them <laughs> mm -hmm. or, or it's, uh, we're drinking 10 energy drinks a day and we should only drink one, whatever it is, as we slowly chop away at getting better at the habits that we should have. Well, mm -hmm. what can we replace a, a bad habit with a good habit? We know that. I mean, that's simple, but when it comes down to it, can we say to ourselves, I promise myself today, instead of eating the donut for breakfast or listening to talk radio on the way into the work today, I'm going to turn on something inspiring instead. And I'm going to reach for that protein shake this time. Mm -hmm. And it's something that if we consistently work on every single day, it'll eventually come to pass. And yeah, you're going to have your, your challenges. There's a big portion of the book called Forgiveness and that we need to forgive ourselves of, of our perfection. It's not gonna happen, you know? And so that's where the habits portion is very interesting. So consider your habits, whether they're bad or great. If they're great, keep doing them. If they're bad and they're affecting relationships or your health or your joy, how can we slowly chop away at them? What are some triggers for them? And how can we make sure that we're keeping a promise to ourselves, even if it's just working on one little habit at a time. For yeah. some people, it might be, I, I need to be better organized. Maybe it's, you know, I shouldn't be glancing over emails that should be read completely through. Maybe it's not spending so much time on social media. I share a story about my son where I was not focused on him and I realized my social media was taking place of this three-year-old boy in front of me having a great moment at the playground and that's when i decided to change that habit on the spot deleted the facebook app off my phone and i said i don't need that app even though when i pressed delete it was like you know it started shaking like the app does it's like <laughs> don't delete me we're best friends and i'm like you're gone so sometimes we can change a habit like that and that habit hasn't returned sometimes it needs to be painful enough to change and, uh, and when it comes to what you were asking about self-care, self, you know, being a little bit more selfless for ourselves, this is a hard one for me as well. That's why I wrote it. That's why I wrote The Promise to the One. It's titled The Promise to the One because you are the one. You yourself are the one. And we keep promises to our boss. We keep promises to our customers. We keep promises to our team. We keep promises to our family, but we often, there's not anything left for the promise to ourself. And so leaning into that, when it comes to the promise to self, what can we do to take care of ourselves just a little bit more today, mm -hmm. especially in a COVID pandemic quarantine type world that we are still living in, you know, no, no lines have ever been so blurred between work and home and and maybe even burning out completely doing zoom calls and and all that we're going through it's crazy what we've done to ourselves and so how can we make sure that we're caring for ourselves whether that's stopping once in a while after a zoom call and saying i need five minutes i'm mm -hmm. gonna lay down on the ground in my office that's what i have to do or you know you're let's say you're making sandwiches all day and you need to you need to take that break. You need to have that moment. It's, it's giving yourself just a little bit more life. You can't drive a car without gas in it. You mm. can't ride a horse without feeding it. Just like what, what I understand one of your favorite ones are, the, the airplane one. Tell us the airplane one. Well, just, you know, just that if your pressure, you know, is lost in a plane and, and, the, and the air, um, the oxygen uh, masks come down, you know, or are you supposed to give it to your two-year-old child or do you put it on yourself? And a lot of people say, you know, the two-year-old child, cause they can't help themselves. And, and the idea is that if, if you die, you're not any good to help the two-year-old. So I think that's kind of what I'm, what I really am seeing a lot is um, the guilt um, that, that people feel when um, the selfishness that they feel sometimes when they are taking care of themselves and that actually not taking care of themselves. And I'm 55 years old and something I'm learning myself. I, I'm out of shape. Um, I don't eat correctly. There's a lot of these things. I have a wife, beautiful wife. I have a great daughter and a son. And uh, actually it was my daughter and my wife who kind of brought it up to me. They're like, you know, 
they were upset with me because I wasn't taking care of myself. And I'm like, well, but I'm taking care of you. I'm taking care of everybody else. And you can't do that when, well, you wouldn't be able to take care of anybody else if you're, if you're not around. And uh, that's the idea with the air mask is you put it on yourself first. So you're healthy, you're safe, you're strong. So you can take care of those who need you. Um, and that's, that's very cool. It's very cool that you have family that would, you know, mention that. Yeah. And that's what's important to surround ourselves with people like that. And what's even more important is when they say something that you know is for your best, even if it's offensive for a moment, is to listen. I mean, we don't listen enough, do we? And I know that of recent, because we're filming this and recording this during the winter months, but yeah. during, the, during the winter months, I did not ski. And I live in Utah <laughs> with the best snow on earth. Yeah. And I have a ski pass, John, for the whole, for the whole season, all <laughs> winter. And I didn't go skiing. And, and it was like the beginning of March. And my wife was like, Hey, it's almost spring. The snow's almost gone. Have you gone skiing? I yeah. saw it last weekend, right? Did, did, yeah. Did you see my post? I, I, did. Like, it was, I, thought, I thought it was fake actually at first. That that's how <laughs> beautiful it was. It's so beautiful here. But I, I said, no, I've been so busy launching this book making a living, keeping us surviving. My wife said to me, put everything down today and go up to the mountain, Thank go God. skiing. Yeah. And I was like, I don't have time. I have to work. She said, you're breaking the promise to the one. And I was like, thanks a lot, honey. All right. <laughs> yeah. 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 So we must listen when they have our best interest at heart. And I think that the, the idea of the promise at first, it's the promise to yourself you know, maybe the perception is, well, a promise to yourself is kind of selfish, but I think the promise to yourself isn't, it's not that. It's about, um, again, taking care of yourself so you can take care of others. And the biggest thing that I've learned in, in the leadership stuff that I am actually able to teach is uh, we, we have a thing called in life view. My wife and I put it together and it's the, it's the basically the life pie and we just did our own version of it, but you want to have that life balance and I usually tell managers on the first day of our, our class, I'm like, you know, guys, if you want to be a leader, you know, it's not a position, but if you're a mess, people are eventually not going to lead you or follow you. And, um, you know, they need to take care of themselves first so they can then take care of others. And that's not selfish. That's kind of really where I think your book, The Promise is the perfect, uh, you know, tool to be able to help them not feel guilty. I think that's, I think that's kind of one of the things I got out of the book really was it's okay. And it's really self selfish. If you don't keep that promise to yourself, that it's self, we want to be selfless to others, then you need to keep the promise. That's right. And it's, it is a challenge to articulate, especially to people perhaps that are only used to serving others a hundred percent of the time. Mm -hmm. And they just have forgotten about their own self care. Mm -hmm. And where this gets sloppy, this concept is when we're talking to people that are already selfish and we're hoping that they'll serve or give more in mm -hmm. their leadership. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's the fine balance. And that's where we need to have somebody that is a mentor that might look at us and say, Hey, are you taking care of yourself? I mean, are you, are you sleeping at night? Or are you watching Netflix all night? What, what are yeah. you doing? Because you're not 100% today. And if we can listen to that mentor and say, yeah, I, I need to take better care of myself, then they become like an accountability partner. And they become somebody who helps us keep our promise to self. I know for me, that's my wife. That's my business partners. They yeah. all say to me, hey, you did all this work. That, that took way more than the 10 or 12 hours it should have. How long did it take you? And I'm like, well, I just stayed up all night. No big deal. And they're like, no, that's a problem. We're in business together. Yeah. We don't want you to kill yourself on accident. Exactly. So, right. No. Yeah. Yeah. And, then, and, then, and, and again, you know, you're trying to give everything to them because you want to, you want them to feel like you're doing your part and you're helping them make successful. And then we turn around and they're like, wait a second, but by you doing that, you're actually potentially making us less successful. Um, you know, and, and that, and that's, that's, uh, that's, that's what I loved uh, about your message. And I think that, um, you know, keeping a promise to yourself is not selfish. 
Um, but it's selfless. It's selfish when you don't. And um, I love it. And uh, I, I, I definitely will uh, make sure we get this book out there and, and um, people need to add it to. So we have like this success library uh, and, and we put it up there. And now I do have to share another thing with you because I had to laugh. And so uh, I'm showing my age a little bit and you got, you remember these things, right? Cassettes. Oh yeah. All right. Hello. So, so this is 1986, 1987. And look who this guy is right here. Ogmandino. Ogmandino. <laughs> Bow to the king. <laughs> to the king. Yeah. Oh, uh, man, I love Ogmandino. Uh, it was him. You know, the three guys that I used to get a kick out of was uh, Leo Biscaglia. Was that his name? Is that oh, his yeah. Name? Uh, Zig Ziglar and Ogmandino, the three three oddest names. But uh, <laughs> uh, so I have all these things, uh, 1986, 87. I would drive, open up a store, put a cassette in there. And I remember, you know, going to Barnes and Nobles when they first opened up and you'd go to the self-help aisle because that's what they called it. I put my hood up, hope I didn't see anybody. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and we were ashamed, you know, people were, uh, you know, were ashamed to, to say, Hey, I need help. Um, I, I, I kind of, can you help me? I, I want to ask your advice. And, uh, Thank God today people are are less embarrassed about it. I don't know what it was, but um, you know it's it's uh, interesting. I, I got a kick out of that as soon as I heard you tell the Ogmandino stories. Ogmandino, no one knows it. You know, I love Ogmandino. Right that's some of the best stuff ever. So if the, yeah. anybody that's uh, listening or watching, <laughs> go get the greatest salesman in the world. Go oh, get yeah. some of these classic books because I'll tell you something. As good as I feel the promise to the one is the book that I wrote. I mean, this stuff has already been written in its own way. I, I'm just doing a new spin on it. I mean, let's just be candid. You know, it's not like I own the word promise and the first guy to write about it. Uh, all these guys, Ogmandino, Norman Vincent Peale, Stephen Covey, Napoleon Hill. I mean, you go back way back. You just keep going to, you know, even to Socrates and Plato. I mean, it's and, and the Bible, it's all in there. So I, I would, I would challenge, <laughs> I would challenge your listeners okay. I like to that. a call to action. If we could, I think that's important, especially with this self-care concept habits, you know, keeping promises to self. I, I'm not sure if the people listening and watching are journal writers okay. or if they just keep a journal on their, on their phone or online or even handwrite it, which I think is the best way. Mm -hmm. Because cognitively, from our brain to the pen to the paper is something beautiful that is intrinsically human uh, action. And so what I would recommend for anybody that's interested in improving okay. would be to write down some of the promises that you've broken to yourself and what it's done to your life. And not in a bad way, just in a way to say, gosh, I, I should not have missed out on my kid's soccer game because I was going to do a podcast interview. You know what I mean? Mm. And instead said, mm. you know, I reached out to the guy I was going to interview. And instead I said, Hey, my daughter has a soccer game. I didn't realize, you know, I double booked. And so uh, is, it, do you understand why I need to cancel? And the interviewer or interviewee goes, well, of course, I admire you even more for reaching out. <laughs> Does this resonate with you, John? Um, yeah. Uh, my wife actually from the other room. So it's, apparently she's been listening. Uh, she just giggled and it resonates me. You know, and I think too, um, Jason is that a lot of people will say, you know, I'm not good at writing. I, I you know, I can't get what I'm, and I was one of those. I was absolutely. But if you want to get better, you need to make that promise to yourself that you have to do what's uncomfortable sometimes. And you don't have to write a paragraph. You don't have to write five pages, but, you know, taking, you know, what's going on in your head and bringing it through your arm, through that pen onto a piece of paper. Uh, it's something I've, I'm trying to keep that promise to myself. My wife is very, very good at that. Um, I'm trying to, but, but your challenge is, I, I love it. And then another thing too, I was thinking of, and I don't want to keep it too long too, but um, I think what happens, or I know what happens is we always talk about habits and then we address the bad habits. And when I talk about coaching and you know this from basketball and all this kind of stuff that the best coaches don't focus only on what's wrong. They focus on what's good as equal equally as important because if you don't focus on what's good, that becomes bad. 
And I think when it comes to habits and promises, what I was thinking a couple of minutes ago with the promise part is the guilt that is associated with breaking a promise. And that if you believe in the faith that we believe in, I'm Christian, you know, we had come from different vantage points from the Christian faith, um, but that we're not perfect, that it's okay to, you're not breaking a promise if you're doing everything you can, you're human. And breaking a promise isn't mean you failed. Um, and maybe we can end on that. I mean, what would you give somebody who is maybe beating themselves up? And there's a lot of people out there today that we know that are just, I'm not good enough. I'm not worth it. Uh, I, I don't think I can do it. Uh, I, I tried and it, I failed. I, I didn't follow through. Um, and they're self-defeating, that self-defeating um, part. How, how does the promise, what promise could they make to themselves to keep moving forward? Because too many people are giving up. Yeah, and I, I appreciate very much that approach. I mean, if you wanted to go to that place where you write all those bad things about yourself down, and then you write it, and then you rip it out and throw it away. Okay, That's good. a perfect way to get that out of your brain. Oh. And, and it's almost a purge, like if you ate something poisonous, you mm -hmm. got it out. Now it's ripped up and it's gone. Or just type it, type it, type it, and then delete it all. And then imagine writing what your habits are, what your life looks like now. And then look at it and say, okay, now aspirations. What do I aspirationally want to become? Mm -hmm. And then you create your life around promises kept. Mm -hmm. And it's not like we have to set these huge proclamations. It's the little promises that add up to make the great life. And so when we look at the way that we've been, we look at the way things are, we look at the way things can be, it's in the aspirational habits, goals, promises. I like to say, why set a goal and we can make a promise? And so, because usually a goal has a deadline, you know, and once you hit it, you, you just, you start something over. Or if you miss your goal, you just laugh it off and set another goal. A promise is a sacred goal. A promise is a behavior. A promise is something that becomes us. And so when we promise ourselves that our habits will change and we then write down on our calendar each day, I kept the promise today to work out. I did 10 minutes. That was all I had in me. Mm -hmm. Yay me. Yeah. Type it out. Commit to it. That's when we change our lives and we don't need to beat ourselves up about the, the broken promises because not only do we believe that there is somebody who made the greatest promise to us of all time, and we can accept that promise for ourselves, and we can live, you know, the best life we can. If we believe that in our faith, then awesome. If we don't have that, that type of belief system, how can we believe in ourselves? Mm. How can we put something great into, our, into the world? And that's where we aspirationally write down, this is the life I want to create for myself. This is the person I want to become. This is the legacy I want to live and leave. And so how can we keep greater promises to ourselves? It's in committing to the little promises, that the promises to the one, which yeah. is ourselves. Well, I mean, I can't, you can't write a better ending to that right there. Um, you know, I don't want to ruin this uh, by asking another stupid question. No, I'm joking, but that that's perfect. Gave me chills actually, Jason. So, uh, you know, as somebody who um, is in a position of having the opportunity to inspire others and not wanting to be um, disingenuous with it, but also struggling with the fact that I inspire others, they look at me as somebody who's like, wow, you know, I don't have it all together. And I tell them that. And, um, you know, I know that trying to become the best version of myself every day is, you know, what I need to do first. And it's not being selfish. Um, it's you know, I need to be selfless. And uh, so definitely, you know, for everyone who's going to get to watch this here, uh, The Promise, Jason, if you wouldn't mind, I mean, there's obviously your website, and maybe there's a couple little um, very worthy and uh, plugs that you can have. So what, what was the best way for people to learn about yourself and the book and even your new organization, the new project that you started, which I'm super excited about? Well, thanks, John. You know, the if somebody goes to Amazon and they get the promise to the one, that's a great place to get it. 
I might recommend it on Audible, you know, the audio version, because then you get to hear the performance of me. So yeah. it's not like you're reading it and you're like, oh, then he sang Alvin the, and the Chipmunks. But when yeah. I'm doing it on Audible, I'm like, Christmas, Christmas yeah. town of my, <laughs> yeah. you know, so that makes it more fun. If you want a, a performance and inspirational listening while you're driving. But my website is jasonhewlett.com, which is my name. Mm -hmm. And really what I'm most excited about is the launch of the Promise Institute. So yeah. if your listeners go to promiseinstitute.com, they can find out about the leadership game that we're now uh, offering to organizations to help them create a promise culture within their leadership. Okay. So imagine having myself and, uh, and other trained, amazing coaches coming into your organization, either virtually or in person and say, these are some of the blind spots. These are some of the great strengths. Let's assess your culture and figure out how we can make it into a promise culture through the ICM process of identify, clarify, magnify, et cetera, et cetera. It, it's revolutionizing the companies that are taking advantage of it. And, mm -hmm. and, and within that, John, there's also, you know, the video book and other things that online digital promise, and there's the online course of the promise. There's a lot going on. It's very exciting where it's going. And I'm just really grateful for guys like you who not only buy the book, yeah. but buy multiple copies. I'll never yeah. forget the picture of the fanned yeah. out copies you sent yeah, me yeah. and that actually have read it, listened to it, preach it. Brother, you're awesome. I appreciate you. Thank you for oh. keeping the promise to me. Well, no, and, and, and same here. And, and I hope to uh, stay in touch with you. And kind of a cool thing is uh, you have the, the Salt Lake City Mafia, you know, with yourself, Ty Bennett. Uh, I'm, I'm hopefully going to get to – he's agreed that he would chat with me. Um, your buddy Clint Pulver is one of the young guys coming up. And, and then uh, the other gentleman that, that we know that we've been lucky enough to meet. Uh, and for me, as a, as a fan of, of these things, uh, I'm, I'm just – I'm a kid in a candy store just getting to talk to you guys. And it's a – it's an honor, a privilege, and uh, I, I will be uh, sharing this with as many people as I can. And I definitely hope to see you and, and talk to you soon. Thank you, my brother. You All as right. well. Appreciate All it. Right. Have a great day. Okay. Okay.